Till, why is Gen Z avoiding the vaccination? The COVID-19 vaccine is available now to everybody 16 and older. But apparently 25 and younger, eh, meh, not signing up. Interest in the vaccine plummeting among young people. Trying to figure out what's going on here. Um, impact it might have on herd immunity, ending the pandemic, stopping the spread of the virus. Uh, at the beginning, Gen Z was more eager to get the vaccine. But now quite a few are planning to skip it. Happy to welcome Todd Furness, uh, author of the 60% Solution, Rethinking Healthcare. Todd, how are you? I'm doing great. How are you today? Fine, thank you. So, why? Why is the reluctance there at 25 and under, particularly when early it wasn't? Did they get information they didn't like? Well, I think that's quite likely. I think there are a couple things going on. Uh, First of all, Young people tend to believe, I kind of laugh about this, I think they're, they tend to believe they're immortal. Uh, but I think the other thing is that they've observed that uh, not many young people who are healthy or fit, uh, meaning they're not overweight, uh, get the disease, or if they do, they don't have symptoms, or if they do have symptoms, they're typically mild. So there is an, an ang- there's a belief that they're not going to get something bad or have something bad happen to them, coupled with the fact that they hear stories about the vaccination being hastily developed or under-researched, and then they hear about some of the complications arising out of the vaccinations themselves. You know, the J&J stories have been widely spoken of, and then you have issues with the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccines. So I think at the end of the day, they're saying, well, it looks like some bad stuff could happen, and there, it's unlikely that some you know, that's some bad stuff's going to happen if I don't take the vaccine. So I think I'm going to wait and see. Well, I mean, if if you look at the numbers, the young people with no pre-existing that you know this under 19, that the flu is more deadly than coronavirus. So they do have that going for them. But I mean, the impact on the herd immunity stuff. What what what's that about? Well, you know, I think that herd immunity is is uh, misguiding. In a, as a term, I mm-hmm. think that you know, we, we have to recognize we're never going to be without disease when we're never. So that means that people, some people always get the disease and uh, the disease is never going to go away in its, in its entirety. So it's, the real issue we ought to be looking at is what level of risk are we as a nation willing to tolerate? And you correctly point out that the mortality rate for COVID is uh, slightly above the flu. Uh, what I would point out is that the real issue is obesity. You know, 78% of all people who are hospitalized, intubated, or died from COVID were obese. We have a great number of states in the United States. In fact, most states in the United States have over 30% of their population characterized as obese. And so that obesity is not just a question of having too much weight for your joints. It's a question of having all sorts of other problems that adversely affect your systems and your organs and your yeah. your blood quality. Yeah. Why is it is it not appropriate since you know so much about healthcare, Todd? Could you not bonus people that are in better shape as far as lower rates, or do they do that already? You know, it's funny that you say that because there are certain instances where that happens, and there's a great story in a in the opening a portion of a book written by a guy named Sean Flynn uh, talking about the Singapore system for healthcare. And I'm not an advocate or for or against the Singapore system, but it's funny because the guy is asking like, his cab driver, do you like your healthcare system? And he says, no, I hate it. And he says, why is that? He says, because if I don't go to the gym, they charge me more. There you go. So, <laughs> there you go. I mean, <laughs> it, what, I I mean what, what, what's, I mean, seriously, what's wrong with suggesting that if you are obese, you have more health problems, thus it's more expensive, thus I want to motivate you to not have to pay $60,000 a year after tax dollars to be covered. I mean, it's crazy the prices right now. Well, the, the prices are crazy because we've got all sorts of perverse incentives rising out of insurance companies, and the real issue is insurance. If you think about it, I don't know about how old you are, but I'm an old guy. I'm 61, and when I was growing up, my mom was constantly fussing with me to go outside and play. Yeah. And she always telling me what to eat and when to go to bed. In other words, eat right, sleep right, and get some exercise. Well, that's pretty much what we ought to be doing. And you couple with that with the fact that the cost of health care at the time was a lot less expensive, but in part because we didn't have insurance reacting the way that it does today. We've transformed insurance into a layaway plan for health. 
So now what we're concerned about is not do we get sick, it's how much is our copay or deductible mm-hmm. if we have to go to the doctor. So if I put you in charge of this uh, as President of the United States, Todd, could you fix health care? I would like to think I could, but I don't know that I would ever <laughs> pass the test to be a president. No, I'll be the president. I'll appoint you. I'd love to. <laughs> I'd love to have the opportunity yeah. because I mean, for, they, for they, you to be the president. But. Well, there's, there's got to be some common sense in there, too, because right now, whatever happened with Obamacare hasn't worked for me, and it hasn't worked for millions of families that are priced out of it. It's unbelievable, the cost. One of the things I think is really interesting is I've kind of just anecdotally asked a bunch of CEOs, where do you get your health care insurance from? And most of them cannot answer that question. And so the the issue around insurance has been so overriding and so complicating that it's in a very insidious way adversely affected our health itself, in my view. And so we need to get back to a way, a place where we take individual responsibility for our health and we pay for our health care directly. And we need to do things to free up the cash for individuals to do that. And that will drive the price down and make it more available and more ubiquitous for, for everybody. What about loser That's pays? What Isn't loser pays effective? In other words, if you sue a doctor and you lose, you pay attorney's costs, and that can help drive down the malpractice insurance? <laughs> Yeah, but I think that that's a, that you know, we talk about malpractice insurance as being an overriding problem, and it certainly is, in, especially in obstetrics, where you know the, the malpractice insurance itself can cost easily over a quarter million dollars a year. It's it's an unbelievable number. Oh. So tort reform is needed, absolutely. But I think that the the other issue is we ought not to be relying on insurance in the way that we do. We ought to really figure out a way to get people the cash in their hands. One of the things I talk about in my book again is uh, health savings accounts. We ought to be yep. able to to fund those and to help fund those in a way that's tax advantaged because it helps everybody when you pay for your health care directly. It helps the doctor. It helps you as a patient. You get to negotiate the price, and it also decreases the burden on the insurance companies. Had an uh, x-ray. It was 1500 bucks. It was a two-minute x-ray. Oh. <laughs> wow. That's just nuts. Yeah, but, but here's the thing about that. So, Steve, you went in and you got, you got an x-ray. And the, if you had said, hey, I'll pay you cash on the barrel head of 250 bucks," there's a pretty good chance they would have taken that instead of having to bill their insurance company because of the cost of billing the insurance company. And there's also risk in billing the insurance company because so, if you get so it wrong. I, I go to the payment pay. window at a big, 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 big medical center and say, I'll give you 250 and they're going to say, I, I don't think they'll say yes. I, I think they have to go through their be, superiors and all that stuff. You'd be... You'd be surprised. Okay. You'd be surprised. All right. Might have to because try that one next time. Is that, <laughs> no, what's happening is that they're, they're looking at this from a cash flow perspective. They're saying, hey, I can get this money right now, or I can take 60 to 120 days, fill out a bunch of forms, no, and maybe not true. get paid in that time. Uh, how do people find the 60% solution and learn more about Todd Furness? You can go to my website called the60percentsolution.com, or there's another website I created called rethinking.healthcare. Uh, or you can get the book on Amazon or Barnes & Noble. Well, support Rick. Uh, Todd, uh, the 60% solution, Todd Furness is spelled F-U-R-N-I-S-S, correct? Yes, thank you so much for saying that. Well, I appreciate that because we need guys to think out of the box like you. You need to be encouraged for trying because you could go play golf or something, and you're trying to fix health care. So we appreciate you very much, and maybe we can have you back sometime. Love to do it. Thank you so much.